folks. My name is Travis. I, uh, I'm a public engagement consultant here at SAS Power. And uh, today over the lunch hour, we're going to spend some time exploring, you know, why nuclear? Why is SAS Power looking at uh, nuclear power from small modular reactors as, a, as one of the options? So we have a, a couple folks sitting on the panel today. Uh, first off is Jason Denev. Jason's a professor at the University of Calgary in energy, which includes nuclear power, electricity, and thermodynamics. And sitting beside him is Darcy Holden. As Darcy's uh, within SAS Power here. He's our project manager and responsible for the small modular reactor development project. Um, so assuming there's a little bit more to your story than your titles, guys, can we uh, can you tell me a little bit about your background and experience before we we get too far in this uh, this presentation? Jason, we'll start with you. Absolutely. So in addition to teaching at the University of Calgary, I also teach energy issues at the University of Regina. Uh, I'm a, a physicist. I'm one of the reviewers for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to the United Nations. And uh, as a father, as an uncle, I really care about the next generation. And I'm terrified that climate change is going to hurt every child everywhere in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, across Canada, and other places as well. Uh, it's already starting and it's going to get worse. Um, I, need to see, I see the need for energy in every society. And this leads to what is called a dilemma. A dilemma is not just a problem. A dilemma is when opposite solutions to the same problem wind up yielding the same results. So we need to have energy and it needs to stop and it needs to come from, from not burning stuff. Um, and the more I learn about nuclear power, the more I believe we need to include nuclear power as part of the mix with wind and solar and hydro and all these other things as part of what we're doing to climate change. And that's what I'm devoted to is teaching people about the science behind those things so they can make better and more informed decisions. I'm the chief editor of energyeducation.ca, which is the world's most used energy education resource for adults. Oh, thank you. Um... Darcy, why don't we just turn it straight over to you? You've been involved in the SMR development project for a little while now, but can you expand a little bit more about your background and, and maybe dive into a little bit of that, you know, why nuclear and, and why this project? Yeah, for sure. So I, I spent almost 20 years uh, in power production with SAS Power. Uh, and so really my, my passion is, is electricity production in Saskatchewan and sustainable electricity production in Saskatchewan. I've spent a lot of time with our fossil assets. Uh, I spent a year climbing wind turbines, a little bit with our hydro up north, uh, and, and most of my career was with the coal. Uh, and I spent a, a large majority of that cleaning it up, uh, involved a lot with the carbon capture project down in Estevan uh, and realizing that. And, and so really what, what, what drove me to nuclear and getting involved with this project is, is the challenge that's facing us. Uh, two thirds or more of our power comes from fossil today in Saskatchewan still. And we need to get that down to zero. Uh, and so I really see, see nuclear power and, and SMRs as an opportunity. It's a huge challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity uh, in, in addressing that, that climate change task in a, in a sustainable manner. Uh, and so it's, I, I think it's a really important project to the province and it's, it's uh, really happy to be here and, and talking to people about it. Excellent. No, thanks. I'm I'm grateful that you're both here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So this would be our fourth conversation uh, in a five-part series that we're hosting. Um, I'm hoping this doesn't come across like a typical presentation-style webinar, but we can you know have that discussion and and take the discussion you know where the folks want it to go. Um, just for you you folks uh, watching here, that again this is our fourth one. The other three ones we we had. Uh, have been recorded. They're up on our, our engagement hub, so you can rewatch them. The first one we did was on uh, our power is changing. So we talked a little bit about all the supply options and, and some of the drivers that are making us look at changing where our power comes from, and nuclear power being one of those supply options we're looking at, obviously. Uh, the second one we, was about how our power flows. So in that, we talked a lot about the grid itself and the challenges of just moving that power from the supply option and, and where it comes from to your home or to your business and, and what SAS Power does to, to manage the, that flow of power. Uh, the third one we had was around small scale technology. 
uh, it's really that conversation around self-generation and storage and, and what some people call that distributed energy. So it's not that centrally um, generated and, and pushed out, but all these small technologies scattered across the grid. Uh, and then that uh, brings us to today that why, uh, why nuclear power. And so let's encourage you to, if you haven't, uh, and you're interested in one of those topics, go back and, and have a, a watch. Uh, so like I said, it's not gonna be a presentation style webinar over the next hour or so. Um, I'm just gonna be queuing up questions and, and toss them towards Jason and, and Darcy here. Uh, so we'll, we'll focus in on around why Saskatchewan and other jurisdictions are, are looking at nuclear power as, a, as an option for the future. Um, I brought with me about enough questions to fill half of the time. And so we'll be looking to you folks to think of those questions that are on the top of your mind and pose them to us and I'll read those out. And, and again, we'll, we'll toss those out to Jason and Darcy to handle and have a discussion around. Again, before we get uh, going though, I would like to share that you know, we here at SAS Power, the, the work we do reaches the ancestral lands of many nations, including those nations in treaties two, treaties four, five, six, eight, and 10, as well as the Dakota and Métis nations. You know, Darcy and I are, are speaking to you from Regina, which falls within that treaty four territory. Um, interestingly uh, uh, enough, um, I was on the road recently going to, uh, a meeting on this file and I was traveling on highway 11 between Regina and Saskatoon. I was pretty happy to, to see the new uh, signs that are up on, on that highway demarking that boundary between treaties four and treaty six. I, I think a, a huge kudos should be given to our office, the treaty commissioner and the ministry of highways for collaborating on that and, and executing that, that project. It's a, it's a physical reminder of the, uh, treaty commitments we made, and, and it's seen by thousands of people a day. It's, uh, um, it was the first time I got to see it, and uh, I was quite pleased that thousands of people a day are going are gonna to see that same reminder. Okay, a few more housekeeping notes before I, uh, uh, we get into the actual Q&A discussion portion. Uh, so there is a chat, uh, chat box within Zoom here. Um, I'm not going to be monitoring the chat, uh, nor is uh, uh, our panelists here, uh, but we do have some technical support on the background. And if you're having trouble operating Zoom or um, this is where you should, you should be interacting. So click that chat function at the bottom, a new pop-up box will, will appear and there you can send a message back to uh, Anna and Karan who are in the background uh, monitoring that chat. For that question, and an answer piece, we're gonna ask that you use the Q&A box. So in a very similar thread, you click the Q&A button, a new pop-up window will appear. There you can type your question. Those, those questions come directly to us. They're not, uh, they don't go out publicly and then we'll, we'll rifle through and we'll read those aloud. So I, I, get, I encourage you to ask your questions, you know, keep them on topic. We're, we wanna keep the focus uh, of this discussion around why nuclear power and, and we're gonna get through as many of those as, as we can in the next hour. Okay, lastly, I think we're gonna start with the video here. There's no audio, Travis. You said there's no audio on that? My bad. Thanks, Darcy, I'm just gonna to have to, oops. Sorry, I got kicked out and I frantically restarted everything. And so. Sorry, folks, let's do this again. My family came to Saskatchewan almost 45 years ago. It's a land of living skies. You just have to look up and just be in awe by the beauty of it all. And it is a great place to live and work and raise a family. 
In Saskatchewan, we value our wide open spaces, blue skies, and vast waters. At Sask Power, we are looking at all options to ensure that we can enjoy them for generations to come. We are in the midst of this energy transition. We need to achieve a 50% reduction in our emissions by 2030 from 2005 levels and a net zero emission profile by 2050. That's where nuclear power from small modular reactors could help. SMRs offer emissions-free power 24-7 that can complement the work we are doing with other energy sources. SMRs are the right size for our grid as they produce roughly the same amount of power as our existing coal and gas plants. It's not only creating the foundation of reliable, cost-effective, sustainable power, but it's going to create economic development and social opportunities for everyone. Saskatchewan is home to some of the world's highest grade uranium, 75% of which is exported. My name is Ron Hagen, I'm the CEO of Kitsaki Management and we're the economic development arm of Lac Forange Indian Band. We did start in the north in the uranium industry and it's been 41 years. It's moved our people ahead, but there's a long ways to go. So that's where our focus is with players like SAS Power moving ahead in different industries and technologies. It's important that we understand all impacts. A decision to build a small modular reactor won't be made until 2029. We'll be hearing from people across the province. To prepare for the decision, a potential site needs to be chosen so that planning and evaluation continues. I'm so proud to be contributing in the way that I've been asked to serve and to help the people of this province think about their power future and how we can make sure that we can transition to clean energy. All right. So. Well, first, I apologize for that kind of stopping and starting. It seemed it was every time I moved on my end, it, it kind of hiccuped. So I, I hope that came through for you folks. But in that video, you would have seen our, our CEO, Ru Campania. He highlighted a few key considerations for you know why SMRs are a good fit in Saskatchewan. Uh, I want to start our conversation here. I want to focus in around you know those emission reduction targets that, that he mentioned. So because SAS Power and other utilities are working towards uh, zero emission electricity generation. So, so Jason, maybe I'll 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 throw the first one to you. You know, we talk about emission reduction targets. Um, how much greenhouse gas emissions are generated from nuclear power? So, when you when you answer that question, you gotta gotta look at it two ways. There's the direct emissions, and then there's the life cycle emissions. The direct emissions at zero. Running a nuclear power plant, you don't have greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the life cycle though includes building it, making the fuel, storing the fuel, transporting it to its final repository and so forth. And when you look at that entire life cycle, there are some, and it's comparable to wind and solar, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher. It kind of depends on how you do your life cycle analysis, but it's hundreds of times less over the life cycle than what you have for coal. So. There's people who, who focus a lot on this and they can argue about what the exact numbers are. But the important thing to understand is those numbers are very low. Yeah, that there's, Jason, you're, you're a reviewer with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And, and that body has released a lot of reports that support that. Uh, life cycle emissions, operating emissions are zero. And from SAS Power's perspective, that's what we're focused on. But we also consider life cycle carbon footprint. And until a lot of the, the concrete and steel industries decarbonize uh, and find energy sources for themselves that are carbon free, there are, there are an emissions with that life cycle footprint. Uh, but, but universally, you see international bodies uh, characterize nuclear as even lower than than wind in some cases or equal to wind in terms of carbon footprint uh, and that's important and that's not coming from international nuclear industries this is coming from the united nations that the panel on intergovernmental panel on climate change those type of bodies the international electrical association uh, 
uh, with reports that, that look at all technologies available. All right, so can we drill into this one just a little bit more? So first you talk a little bit about life cycle emissions and, and, and maybe we should you know, define like, what, the, what does that actually mean? Um, and then how does that, how does nuclear compare to those other options? Okay, so um, life cycle emissions means you need to look at everything associated with building a nuclear power plant. So when you form the concrete to build a nuclear building, uh, you, you have cement, you have sand and so forth mixed together to make that concrete. The process of actually turning those ingredients into concrete emits a certain amount of CO2. And one of the numbers you'll find on the internet is the, uh, the CO2 associated with building a nuclear plant is worse than the CO2 associated with building a coal plant. And that's one of those true but misleading statements. Um, anytime you, you have concrete, if you have a concrete building, if you have a, an asphalt road, whatever it is you have, when you're, when you're going through the process of making Portland cement, you are emitting CO2, just how we make our cement, how we make our concrete. Um, so that is a thing that happens, and that's part of the life cycle analysis. So when you compare that to, say, wind, wind also uses concrete and it uses more concrete than a nuclear power plant does when you, when, when you do all the math. So that's where their CO2 is coming from. Okay, so that's, that's a thing we're accounting for. You have to mine uranium fuel. So that's one of the things Saskatchewan, I think Saskatchewan should really shout this from the rooftops a lot more. Nothing against Sask Power, but my God, Cameco has done amazing, amazing work. So I guess it's year-end Kona, but it, I, I know it under Cameco, has done amazing, amazing work in, engaging in First Nations, uh, including them in, in part of the mining process and so forth. But they're actually driving stuff around. And what are we driving? We're driving trucks that involve diesel. Uh, sometimes you're driving cars that involve some gasoline. All of that is included in the life cycle analysis. Once again, if you're comparing this to wind, you're having to dig up neodymium. Neodymium is a rare earth magnet. It's part of that middle of the periodic table that you usually ignore in, in high school chemistry class. I, I certainly did. Um, but that's where the really, really strong magnets come from. Where are we getting our neodymium? We're getting it from mines in China. So when you run the equipment there, you have to have gasoline and trucks and diesel and so forth. All of that is included in the life cycle analysis. So when we, when we look at all of that together, what we can say is that nuclear does really, really well. Specifically, Canadian nuclear technology has actually beaten the nuclear technology from other parts of the world, partially because of the awesome work that's happened in the nuclear sector in Saskatchewan for the past several decades. Did, did that answer your question, Travis? Yeah, oh, and, and then some, thanks. Let's uh, slide on. I, there's a few questions in the in the chat, but I think they kind of align the align here. So now it sounds like, like I said the nuclear is a good option when we look at it through that reducing emissions lens. Um, Darcy, can you walk us through like what the timeline is for nuclear power in Saskatchewan? How how close are we? Yeah, that's 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 part of the challenge, and it, and it's a challenge for any large scale energy project uh, is the timeline to implement. There, the, the planning process and the regulatory process takes a significant amount of time. Uh, and that's true for all, all major energy projects. But when you think about a nuclear project in a greenfield jurisdiction, it's, it's even more so. So there, there's more, more effort needs to go into upfront planning and development before you're ready to transition into construction and then transition into operations. Uh, and so, so that's why you're, we're hearing a lot about nuclear power really early in the process in Saskatchewan, even though it might not be a, an option for our grid until we're thinking the mid 2030s. And that's what you're seeing on this chart here. About 2034 is, is the earliest possible date we could have a nuclear reactor operating in Saskatchewan. And we're doing a whole bunch of planning work leading up to uh, a construction decision that we're planning around the end of this decade. In 2029, we'll look to to put the final business case together and, and make that transition into the construction phase. And after about another four years, uh, we'd, we'd move into operations in this time frame. And so, yeah, that's, it is part of the challenge of developing this project and, and this early engagement and early sharing and, and 
information gathering around perceptions of, of nuclear power and how we're going to tackle this, the challenge of climate change in Saskatchewan is, is really important to us. Yeah. I'm going to lean into this uh, a little bit more and I'll, I'll maybe ask both uh, Darcy and Jason to, to answer, but like that's a long lead time. We're looking at that 10 to 15 years for that, from that plan to construction decision to, you know, pushing power to the, to the grid. Um, I know it's a, a question I've seen on the engagement side is like, did we, did we miss the boat on nuclear power? Like why, why do we think SMRs are, are still a good option for Saskatchewan given the, such the long lead time? Well, maybe I'll, I'll jump in there first, Jason. So the, it, it's, it's base load, reliable emissions-free power that we need in Saskatchewan. And it's this transition to get off uh, conventional fossil fuels. Uh, so that, that's driving the need. Uh, yeah, you know, we're a regulated electricity market in Saskatchewan and, and the challenge around the time frame and the, the effort that's needed to go into planning and developing this supply option is manageable in our jurisdictions. That's, that's part of the opportunity we have with a regulated market. Uh, some of those long-term challenges can, can be dealt with in a manner to, to, that takes, reaps the benefit of what SMRs might represent for electricity production. You know, I, I saw a couple of questions in the comment or in the in the chat there around the business case. There, the, there was a uh, the SMR action plan that was released, I think, last year, uh, indicated the business case would be done in 2022. Uh, there's a lot of options on how you look at deploying nuclear power, and early early kind of analysis is being done on investment in R and D uh, and supply chain, that type of thing that enables the, the full business case to come together by 2029 to make the decision whether or not to build by SAS power. And so the, that, well, that business case that was in the action plan was, is more along the lines of, of services beyond electricity production that nuclear power might represent to Saskatchewan, fuel fabrication and things like that, that is being looked at by the provincial government a little bit broader. But really, it's it's reliable emissions-free power that we're looking for, uh, and our early indication is that it could be cost competitive as well. Uh, so keeping our rates as competitive as we can, we'd look to nuclear power to do that as we transition away from conventional fossil fuels. Uh, and if if it's not going to do that, then we just simply won't implement implement it. If there's other options that can can transition us uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, that are cheaper, then we'll we'll look at implementing more of those options. But as of today, we feel that it's it's very prudent that we keep nuclear power as an option, and we do the work to enable it as a as a an option to the province by in the timeline that we've laid out here. Right. Uh, Jason, to you, do you have more thoughts around you know if it like that long lead time and um, you know given the ten to fifteen year timeline, like what well, makes SMR a good option for the for the province? Um, I, I have a few thoughts. Uh, one, climate change is a bigger problem than people realize. Even when people are talking about, oh, we need to do something about climate change, it's a bigger problem than people realize. The amount of coal that Saskatchewan burns, if you put it on a train, would run roughly from the uh, Saskatchewan US border up to the Saskatchewan border with the territories. That's one year of coal for, for Saskatchewan. Um, and, and that's you know, not even getting into the natural gas or the, the, the oil we use for transport. We need so much more power than, than most people are aware. Now, I'm sure people from, from SAS Power think about this stuff all the time because that's, that's their job. But um, worldwide, if we continue to get more efficient light bulbs and so forth, uh, more efficient computer chips, the way we have been, then the world will need five to 10 times as much electricity as it has right now five to 10 times as much. Now that's, sorry, five to 10. Um, and if we, if we didn't have those efficiencies, that would be 15 to 20 times as much. But if we want electric cars on top of that, so for you know, the people who wanna drive a Tesla someday, I mean, they're, they're cool looking cars, but you know, I don't know, um, or maybe you like a different type of electric vehicle, you have to double that again the amount of electricity we're going to need going forward is enormous. For the past 40 years, the rate at which general energy use worldwide has increased is double the population growth. 
but electricity growth is double that. So Saskatchewan specifically is in a, a, this great position where it can be leading this technology. There's a question we'll get to eventually about how many small modular reactors are currently operating out there. And there was a question about safety and a question about waste. And we'll, we'll get to those questions as well. But I want to be clear that if Saskatchewan goes the path of having these small modular reactors built, that makes Saskatchewan a hub of nuclear excellence. And as other countries around the world, other jurisdictions across Canada, across the US, around the world, wind up being in a situation where they're building similar reactors, then Saskatchewan actually becomes a talent export where their expertise winds up being something in demand around the world. So it is very much, as I'm fond of saying, part of the solution. It can't be all of it, but I think it's a really important part of the solution and the opportunities for power, for medical isotopes that cure cancer, um, I've got some students researching how these small modular reactors can actually be used to build uh, better cancer treatment facilities, because that's one of the things that nuclear reactors do is they actually save lives with things like cancer. So there's a lot of opportunities beyond power that I think Saskatchewan will wind up seeing the benefits from. But once again, that's not the question on the table right now. The long lead time is unavoidable. That is unfortunately just part of the game for electricity planning and for electricity grid um, and, and for nuclear. Nuclear does not do quick well. It just, that's, that's a weakness of nuclear. It just does not do quick very well. But the need is going to be there. And I, I applaud Sask Power's long vision for seeing this need going forward. Yeah, that, that, the, the need is there, right? And I don't, I don't think we're gonna have the option of saying, you know, we, we can rely all on nuclear, we can rely all on carbon capture and or renewables and battery storage. We're gonna need all of our low or zero emissions options to make this transition in an economic and sustainable way as soon as we can. So th those electrification things you're talking about, they're coming to Saskatchewan as well. So not only do we have to replace two thirds of our current generation capacity with, with something else that is low or zero emissions, we also have to manage the increasing demand associated with electrification. And we've got projections out to the 2030, 2040s that, that are substantial. Uh, and the pace at which other industries electrify to help them decarbonize is gonna put more pressure on us to come up with generation options that, that keep Saskatchewan's energy affordable and reliable. Uh, so it's, it's really important that we're, we're looking at all of the options that are available and then we can deploy them in a way that makes sense in a, in a safe and reliable and a cost effective way, right? Hey, I got a couple of questions coming through the chat that tie into this, like the timeline and the slide that we have up. So um, they might be SAS power centric. So the Darcy, these might be for you. Uh, first one is, you know, as the transition moves forward and given the very delayed lead time, is plan is the plan to convert the coal-fired power uh, generation to cleaner, lower emission gas until SMRs can be uh, be uh, in place? Yeah. So as we as we transition away from coal and we think about things like nuclear power, other technologies are going to be needed. Uh, and as of today, gas is the only 100% reliable power generation option we have uh, that that we can we can produce that we can implement on us in a timeline that works that meets our demand and our requirements. So gas is going to be a part of the transition off from coal, and as we look to 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 step our emissions down and ultimately get to that that net zero target, a uh, gas is going to play a role. I, I saw there were some questions about carbon capture, and you you can see end of life. Uh, on this slide with some of our coal, it's 2030, conventional coal has to be retired by 2030. Uh, and then natural gas, conventional natural gas is, is next because it still has an emissions profile. It's much less than coal, but still emits. Uh, and so carbon capture may pay a, play a role in extending the life of some of those assets and, and you can keep them operating in a, in a low or zero uh, emissions profile. But those technologies are still emerging somewhat as well. Uh, we've got a lot of experience with carbon capture on coal and, and it would be very challenging to think about uh, expanding that in a net zero environment with our fleet, but 
it's an option and, and it's something we continue to look at too. So it's, it's going to take everything. We're, we're strengthening our inter ties with other jurisdictions today so that we can, if we need to, we can import some energy for a period of time. Uh, maybe long term we can export and use those same ties to export energy. Uh, but it's it's about staying flexible and keeping the, our options as as abundant as we can. And they're starting to narrow as you think about about drastic emissions reductions. Okay, on the on the coal thread too. There's one more question in here. It's specifically talking to the the workforce piece. So um, yeah, another point that's been been heard quite often is what is the plan to upskill the workforce? Um, to work on SMR technology. You know, specifically, they're looking at the from that coal, coal and oil field workers, and and could they transition over? Now, there, there's a lot of complementary skills required when you think about operating a, any large scale thermal plant like a coal plant compared to a nuclear plant. Uh, they rely on on a steam cycle that's very similar. Uh, you create steam, you run it through a turbine, uh, and then you, you just continue that loop running. With nuclear power, it's, it's the difference is where you get that thermal energy and it's from a nuclear fission process. And that, that has its, its own uh, set of, of core competencies and skills that are needed to safely and securely operate that type of facility. So there's a lot of complementary things and, and I think there's a lot of, of ways to transition those sets of skills in a coal plant to a, a nuclear plant with SMRs. And we're doing a lot of work very early now to map that out. I really understand the, the skills required to safely and securely operate nuclear power plants and how, how what a roadmap might look like to go from the skill set we have in Saskatchewan uh, to a new, uh, some nuclear in our fleet. So it's a big right. part of our early analysis that we're doing. Good. I'm going to take one more from the question that's on this slide and then we'll, we'll slide on to our next themes. But there's a question in here talking about the importing power. So why don't we... Buy more power from Manitoba. You know they have they have access that uh, that they can't sell, don't they? Yeah, it's we import power today from Manitoba. It's just over 200 megawatts or so, uh, and we we we're constantly looking at uh, options where we could expand that. Uh, there isn't there isn't going to be a, a huge excess of power available from Manitoba into the in the years to come, and so it's it's. We definitely try to look at that and we have those discussions. We announced recently a large tie line to the US, uh, the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, we're looking at importing power there. Uh, it was more available and, and uh, the better option for today. So importing power is, is definitely going to be a part of our future, a, a short-term bridge to help us manage the transition. And, and maybe we use those lines, like I mentioned earlier, as, as a means to export energy one day. Now we have a great, great renewable resource in Saskatchewan. We have some of the most cost-effective wind, the most cost-effective solar out of anywhere in Canada. And so we want to we want to aggressively take advantage of that to the degree we can and, and strengthening interties with other jurisdictions might help us do that as well. Oh, great. All right, let's, let's slide on, talk a little bit more about the actual technology piece. So now I know nuclear power has existed in Canada for over 50 years and and right now, Ontario gets about 60% of their power from nuclear. Um, but when we, when we talk about you know, the existing nuclear power generation from large reactors, um, that, that's not what we're talking about uh, here in Saskatchewan. So are SMRs a brand new technology? Jason, do you want to start there? Uh, I can. Uh, sure. So small isn't new. Modular isn't new. Nuclear isn't new, the combo is. So um, commercial, making this for people who are actually getting electricity coming to their house with small is new. Uh, the construction time is, construction time and style is new to, to shorten lead times and so forth. But in terms of having small modular reactors, there was a question earlier, how many small modular reactors are operating in the world right now? And that's a difficult question to answer, but I'll, I'll try. There's roughly 420 to 440 nuclear power reactors in the world on the grid right now. So we usually just say 400 and change. Of those, those that we're talking about are all larger. They are not small scale nuclear reactors. The SMRs are not part of that. 
So what have we seen SMRs for? The military has done small modular reactors largely for submarines, not exclusively, but largely for submarines. So have we seen this stuff before? Yes. This is a new commercial venture though. And um, the BWR-X is the boiling water reactor that the US has built over and over and over and over again, but smaller. This is a bit like saying, okay, Honda has come out with a brand new car that only has two seats as opposed to a full SUV. And Honda has built lots and lots of different cars before. This is just the new particular car that they're doing. Do they have the expertise? Is the fundamental physics of the, do they have the expertise? Yes. Is the fundamental physics of what it is they're trying to do changed? Not remotely. Um, there's things like the PNS uh, paper, and I, I know Professor McFarland. And yes, some of the small modular reactor designs could potentially have a greater volume of waste. And I've, I've, I've talked with her about this, this paper, um, but the BWRX, the, the, the boiling water reactor 10 is not substantially different from what the US has been building for decades. Um, the design changes do incorporate advances in science, science. So we know things like, oh, look what happened with Fukushima. Look what happened with Chernobyl. Look what happened with Three Mile Island. We look at those, we make changes. So the, the engineering is going forward. There's better materials being used. So in much the same way that Honda has been building cars for decades, but they've got better rubber in the tires now than they did in the 1970s, as, as an example. Um, what's important about small modular reactors is because they're small, they fit well with Saskatchewan's grid. If you tried to stick a bunch of traditional can-do nuclear reactors on a grid the size of Saskatchewan, you'd have so much electricity, you wouldn't be able to export it all. You need to be able to have some turn off while they're putting on new, new fuels and others there. Small modular reactors can also do what's called load following. One of the things people don't realize about electricity is that when electricity is, developed, is put on the grid, you have that long to use it. It's, it's snap of the fingers fast. And that electricity needs to be used right away. So you need to balance the amount of electricity that you're making with the amount of electricity that you're using. So small allows that to happen better. Modular means that you can actually have these different uh, nuclear reactors being built in parallel. So we, we were talking before, while we were warming up, about the fact that the GE Itachi a uh, nuclear reactor is going in Saskatchewan, it's going in Ontario, Tennessee Valley Authority down in the United States is looking at building one of these, or building some of these. Uh, Poland is looking at, at doing these. They're just all over the world. This is technology that people are aiming for. And because GE Itachi is a huge company and it's able to actually produce this, they're mass producing this. So in the same way that it's, it's cheaper to buy a car, sorry, I drive a Honda. We could talk about Ford if you prefer, but <laughs> we, we, we see that it's cheaper to mass produce these when you're having to do lots and lots and lots of them. But in every case, the nuclear reactor has to pass the local uh, uh, jurisdictions, responsibility, and so forth. So SMRs are things people are excited about because it's a new business model. It's a new deployment. It's more than just a coat of paint. It is a new design but it's a new design from people who've been doing this for a really, really long time and doing it very, very well. Um, Darcy, I- Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, it's exactly true. The, the, the reason we selected the BWRX 300 for, for clean electricity production in Saskatchewan, and it, it does a very good job of producing clean electricity. The, the X in that actually represents that it, it's the 10th generation of the boi this boiling water reactor that G Atachi, which is, it's a US-based design, has deployed successfully in North America for decades. Uh, they, so the, the BWRX 300 represents that it's, it's just a smaller size of that same boiling water reactor that's been deployed. Uh, safety and security in the nuclear industry are paramount and, and they are very meaningful words uh, in the nuclear industry. We're, we're fortunate in Western Canada in the fact that Canada as a country has a, has a strong history of, 
of safe and secure nuclear operations. We have a, an extremely mature and a globally respected re federal regulator uh, in the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And so we can, we can leverage that experience and, those, those, uh, and the industry in itself, those competencies to do it properly in, in, in a greenfield jurisdiction like we have in Saskatchewan. And, and I know Alberta's looking at, at nuclear power from SMRs as well. Oh, so if, I can, uh, if I can tag on to that, yeah. the question, how safe are SMRs? And then where are the tailings stored? I'm going to split those into two different questions. How safe are SMRs? Um, I would raise my family next to one. Uh, I moved to Alberta specifically because I was told nuclear was, was coming to Alberta. And I went, ooh, ooh, then I'm going to go raise my family there. And it's not just me. Every nuclear expert that I know and I know a lot of nuclear experts in the nuclear industry. Every nuclear expert works and lives, raises their family next to a nuclear power plant if they can. Um, so how safe for small modular reactors? We can talk about core frequency failures and so forth, but it really, boy, I don't know any better way to say it. I would raise my family next to one on purpose, like deliberately move next to one because I, I know that it would actually make my family safer. Tailings are a, uh, a term for mining, and the mine. this is not going to be what's called a mine mouth operation. Uranium mines will continue on in northern Saskatchewan, completely independent of the SMR project. So the tailings that come from uranium mining are part of the uranium mining process, and we can talk about that if you want, um, but that's outside the scope of the small modular reactors. What small modular reactors do have is uh, spent nuclear fuel. And the spent nuclear fuel um, is going to be slightly different than what we're used to here in Canada because it's going to be light water reactor fuel as opposed to heavy water reactor fuel. I can go into those differences if anybody cares. I do teach this stuff for a living at a university. So I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm never sure what people want to know on these, on these things. But the spent nuclear fuel will be stored on site for seven to 10 years in a large swimming pool functionally. Um, water is capable of blocking all of the radiation that comes off of these small modular reactors. So they, they stick the spent fuel inside of a pool on site for seven to 10 years, over which time it becomes thousands of times less radioactive. It's then going to be stored on site in what's called dry storage. So th those aren't tailings, this is spent nuclear fuel. And it, it, it looks like a bundle of rods of metal rods is really what it looks like. Uh, it's not a green ooze. Um, it's not what you see on the Simpsons. It does not leak. It does not flow. It is a solid. It can no more flow than a wrench flows. So you could, if you spilled nuclear waste, it'd be kind of like dumping your tool chest out on the ground. It doesn't actually roll away. And you can actually with a Geiger counter go through and pick it up if such a thing were to happen, but such a thing never has. Um, the next question within this is, how will bodies of water be affected? They will be warmer in exactly the same way the coal-fired power plants and natural gas-fired power plants wind up warming water. Nuclear does the exact same process. I can go through that in a lot of detail if you want. But in terms of algae blooms and fish, that is part of the impact assessment report that SASC Power will have to do. And it will be reviewed both by provincial authorities and by federal authorities. And SASC Power is in for a real treat because the CNSC, um, they're wonderful people and they are very, very key on making sure the Canadians stay safe. And as, as Darcy said, it's a strong regulator. It's a respected regulator. A number of my former students go and work for the CNSC, so I'm particularly uh, proud of them. But the world, actually, the regulators all talk to each other. They, they get together and have conferences and talk about how to be a more effective regulator. And the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, which is the regulator federally, um, is widely respected among, I mean, the Americans are like, well, we're the best. And everybody's also like, well, actually, we really kind of prefer Canada. But, <laughs> but that's just how the Americans are. But, but the CNSC is a very well-respected regulator. There's a number of new countries that are looking at these nuclear reactors. Um, the United Arab Emirates, for example, other Middle Eastern countries are looking at trying to phase away from using natural gas. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is one of the regulators that they talk to to say, how do we do what you do? Because they do pay attention to things like algae blooms and fish 
and water quality? And will you still be able to drink the water? Will you still be able to go fishing? And the answer is yes, that will be carefully monitored. And that is actually something that they, they take care of. Okay, no, thanks for that. And I, well, we could spend a whole hour drilling down in, into this. Um, and that's a great little segue because we are gonna spend an hour drilling down into more of the um, technology aspect of how nuclear works. That's I talked about, we have, um, this is our fourth session of this, our fifth and final one, <clears throat> excuse me, is around that, that topic. So uh, I'm, we're gonna slide on because we could spend a whole additional hour hour right here. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, Darcy. I'm going to throw one to you, and then we're going to flip to the next uh, the next slide. Um, I'm also going to say, like, keep asking questions. We will answer all of these questions, and we'll report out the answers. So if we run out of time and, and we don't get get through them all, like, we'll still answer these questions for you folks. Okay, um, but an interesting one on uh, you, you mentioned about OPG's project, and and all these other uh, folks' interest in the GE Hitachi model. Like, how is SAS Power? working with other nuclear jurisdictions on, you know, scoping out nuclear and learning from those successes and challenges? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. And the, you're seeing a lot of jurisdictions look to the same reactor we selected for the same reasons we selected it. Uh, in terms of clean electricity and, and managing the risk of, of deploying nuclear power, the BWRX 300 is a great option and a great fit. And that's why we're seeing other jurisdictions around the world look at that same reactor. And so it, it definitely is an advantage in, the, in terms of, of managing the risk of deployment. Uh, it is an emerging technology. It needs to be demonstrated uh, and before it's mass deployed. Uh, and we're looking at other jurisdictions to demonstrate uh, to do just that, demonstrate the project before we make construction decisions in Saskatchewan. So we're, we work very closely with OPG, uh, TVA, uh, and others in Canada, existing nuclear entities in Canada, uh, to help uh, manage the challenge of a, of a greenfield deployment in Saskatchewan. Uh, so it's, it's a really important part of the project. It, the, the amount of interest does start to present a challenge in terms of supply chain. Uh, so can, can the supply chain be created to meet the, the demand that is going to be on, on that specific reactor? And so as we look into to planning for the construction portion of the project in the early 2030s, uh, you know, managing that, that supply chain risk is an important part of it too. And so it's, it's, it's definitely more on the advantage side, more on the opportunity side than it is on the challenge side. And, and those experienced nuclear companies and jurisdictions that have nuclear power today, deploying it uh, before we do is, is, and demonstrating it before we do is a huge part of, of risk management for this type of option in Saskatchewan. And so we're, we're strengthening those partnerships every day uh, and leveraging the experience Canada has. Uh, to our benefit in Saskatchewan and Western Canada. Oh, thanks. Okay, we're gonna slide over, and uh, uh, I'm gonna skip over the question that I brought. It, it was, uh, and go back into the into the Q and A here. But we talk a lot about uh, baseload power versus intermittent power, and, and uh, there's a question in here talking about you know it's a myth that renewables can't handle baseload. Uh, detailed computer simulations backed up by real world experience with wind power demonstrate that the transition to 100% energy production from renewable sources can be done. And so first off, can you talk a little bit no, about it doesn't. What, no, what's it baseload first, and then maybe explain that answer a little bit? Well, maybe I'll just jump in there, Jason, quick. Just so like from SAS Power's perspective, it's Base load and intermittent power options are, are a different thing. And the reliability of the grid is extremely important. Uh, we've, we've seen other jurisdictions overbuild renewables, and then it hurts the business case for those renewables. It hurts the cost of electricity in those jurisdictions. And so we look, renewables are a great option, and we've got great resources in Saskatchewan, and we'll be deploying those aggressively in the years and decades to come. But it has to be done in a sustainable way. Today, we back up our renewables with natural gas. Uh, uh, Germany is going to struggle to back up the renewables with natural gas this winter. Uh, and so you, you have to be careful. You have to do it. You have to deploy renewables in an aggressive but sustainable way. They're great sources of electricity. They're, 
they're clean, they're low, they're zero emitting, they're, uh, but the intermittency is there and it has to be appreciated. Uh, and so as, as energy storage options and technologies are developed, that will help us. It'll help us transition away from gas or, or we can look to nuclear power to supplement renewables as well. Uh, but it's, it's finding the right balance uh, of those energy options and those mixes and, and making sure you can meet your base load and your peak demands in, the, in a reliable way. Uh, sorry, Jason, I know you're eager to, to jump on that. So base load is the power you need all the time. Your peak demand is the power when you need it the most. Uh, different jurisdictions have different base loads and different peaks and different shapes of how it goes. The thing about wind power is that there is no self-contained jurisdiction that can use wind power or solar power. Now, if you call hydro renewable, which I do, but not everybody does, hydro can absolutely handle an entire grid. You have Manitoba, which is almost exclusively hydropower, as an example. So if that's what you mean by renewables, then yes, when you have access to the hydro, hydro is a source that can be entirely deployed for, for a grid. When you talk about wind turbines, though, the power from a wind turbine goes as the wind speed cubed. So if you've got 100 megawatts of wind power and the wind speed suddenly cuts in half, you have one eighth. You only have 12 megawatts left. And that's what happens with wind. So when you have jurisdictions that rely extensively on wind, Denmark, for example, Denmark is not an isolated jurisdiction. It's a heavily interconnected jurisdiction. So one of the things that came across the IPCC's uh, desk was the famous Jacobson paper that claimed the computer models and so forth. And that paper is wrong. That paper is not true. That paper is misleading people and it should be retracted and people keep quoting it. And it's the, the, that Stanford paper is just plain wrong. It doesn't work that way. It never has. There is no jurisdiction that is capable of running entirely with wind. When you have somebody like Denmark, what they do is when they have the wind blowing, they export the electricity. And when the wind's not blowing, they import it from places like France, which are powered by nuclear. When you have places like Germany that try to spin up an entire grid on, on the renewables, they simply can't do it. And what you saw is they aggressively went after this and their GHG emissions went up. And this is what happens when you don't properly deploy your renewables. Renewables are part of this solution. They are ab wind, solar, hydro are absolutely things that need to happen. But as Darcy said, it needs to be done properly. Uh, do you want me to get the other things on recycling waste? And Yeah, I was going to steer us back. There's two questions that I, I, uh, we didn't quite get to on, uh, on topic around the waste. So one was about uh, waste recycling as part of that life cycle. And one there was an article shared um, in the chat here that that uh, stated waste from SMRs will generate yeah. well, more waste from, article. Article. Yeah. From, uh, from conventional nuclear. Can, can we address both those kind of together? Or? Sure. Darcy, you want me to handle this? Yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment after maybe. Okay. So there's lots of different types of nuclear reactors being proposed. And that paper talks about various types of nuclear reactors that Saskatchewan is not considering building. So when we talk about the BWRX, this is the 10th generation of boiling water reactors, the waste stream from that will be virtually identical to traditional boiling water reactors, which have been built for decades. If you wanna get into something like recycling, then you get into a different type of nuclear reactor. So something like your molten salt reactor, the thorium reactors that you'll hear people talk about, um, which may or may not use thorium, but it's the molten salt reactors, but the internet talks about them as, as thorium reactors. Those can actually take spent nuclear fuel from a BWRX or a CANDU reactor or one of the traditional light water reactors down in the US. They can take that fuel and they can actually turn that into 50 to 100 times as much electricity. There's a company, Moltex right now, that's in the process of building this out in New Brunswick. It's going to take longer than the timeline that Saskatchewan needs for their grid to be able to have this. Do I believe these, these reactors will eventually be on the grid? Yes. Do I think they will work? Yes. Do I think they will work within my lifetime? 
maybe. So those, there's lots of different small modular reactor designs out there. And it's important to understand that the McFarland paper is talking about SMR reactors in general, not specifically what GE Hitachi is building. There was also a question about what kind of uranium is being used, but they're safer after seven years. It's not the uranium that winds up being so radioactive. When the uranium splits apart, because that's why it's you know, nuclear fission, you're, you're, you're breaking apart the, the atoms inside of that. It's what's broken apart that's so radioactive, not the uranium itself. The more radioactive it is, the faster it comes down to being not radioactive. So that's why the seven to 10 years makes such a big difference. It's not the uranium that's going away. It's the fission daughter products. Um, there was also a question that I saw on my previous comment about the bodies of water. You don't need a great lake in order to stick a small modular reactor. The lakes and rivers that are in Saskatchewan are big enough, but that is part of the siting process that uh, Sask Power will go through. Um, I think Excellent. I think I've taken enough time. Darcy, go go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah, just just a couple of thoughts. Uh, it definitely the water availability and a sustainable source uh, of to heat reject, similar to our coal and our natural gas operations, is part of our evaluation. We've done a lot of work in this area early on, and and as we look for a site, which is one of the very early things we need to develop this type of option. Uh, we, we're doing significant analysis in that area. And, and there are, the, the water bodies in Saskatchewan can support this type of technology in this operation. Uh, and then we need to get into the detailed impact assessment, which will, which will determine exactly what that impact might be. Uh, and we're confident that it's, it's immaterial to the use and, and, and the way those water bodies operate today, but we need to do the analysis and we need to show that. And we've got a lot of experience with our coal plants uh, operating the exact same way uh, with very similar water bodies uh, in southeastern Saskatchewan and south central Saskatchewan too. And so that's a big part of the analysis for sure. And we very much appreciate that water is not uh, abundantly available in Saskatchewan uh, or else we probably have more hydropower here. Uh, but, but taking that into account is early on is, is an important part of what we're doing. The, the waste part, I. You know, I, I've spent my, most of my career dealing with our coal facilities, uh, and and you think about the waste products, let alone outside of CO two emissions that that is associated with production of coal. The the ash, uh, there's mercury in it. There's NOx and SOx that needs to get captured and and controlled, uh, and these volumes are are huge because of the volumes of of coal that we have to burn to get the energy that we need. Like Jason mentioned earlier. Nuclear power, it, it's, it's, it's nothing like that. It, the, the concentrated energy that you get from, from nuclear fuel is it, it's, it's one small pellet about the size of a gummy bear of uranium is the same amount of energy as one ton of coal. Uh, and so that, that speaks to the amount of waste you have to deal with as well. Uh, waste is, is highly regulated. Uh, you have to show that you've got the funding and the capacity and the competence to safely and securely manage that waste uh, for permanently. Uh, and you have to do that before you even start building. You have to show the regulator you've got a long-term sustainable plan for your waste. Uh, and so it takes a lot of management systems to safely and securely manage that waste, which, which speaks to cost as well, but it's all rolled into the project. But the volumes are, are quite manageable. For a, a 300 megawatt boiling water reactor, like the, the one we're looking at, the BWRX 300, a full 60 years of operation, the used nuclear fuel could fit about inside a double car garage. The volume is very low. Now with the shielding and, and protection that's required to keep it safe, it ends up taking uh, more space than that, but, but volumes are, are quite manageable for, for nuclear option in, in my view. To, to put it in sort of a personal context, if all of your electricity, uh, one, one of the people here in Saskatchewan, if all of your electricity came from one of these boiling water reactors, the BWR X10, over your entire life would fit inside of this bottle. That's what your nuclear waste is. So when the McFarland paper is like, oh, it's gonna double. Okay, it might wind up taking two of these bottles to store all of the spent nuclear fuel for your entire life. It's a really, really small, small amount. 
Nuclear waste is awesome. It's scary. It needs to be handled properly. But when I look at the waste stream from, from wind, when I look at the waste stream from solar, those are waste streams that aren't being managed nearly as carefully because they're not as dangerous, but they aren't being necessarily managed as well as they need to be. Nuclear is, it's, it's, um, it's zebras and, and, uh, and lions. You know, you, you go to a zoo and you, you look at a lion, you're like, wow, it's a lion. You go to a zoo, you look at a zebra and you're like, okay, it's a striped horse. Zebras actually cause more accidents. Zebras are more dangerous in a zoo than lions because everybody knows a lion is dangerous. So it turns out that more people die every year from accidents with solar and with wind than ever die with nuclear. And it's, it's actually a real problem. Now, solar and wind is a safer place to work than say the oil sector, but it's still, it's not perfectly safe. And it's not that nuclear is perfectly safe, but because it's so carefully regulated, we actually have fewer fatalities in nuclear, even with things like Fukushima and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, those don't kill as many people as say the Alberta oil sands does. Okay, right. I'm gonna slide us forward. We're five minutes over our, our promised timeline. I, I haven't seen too many folks drop off. So thank you folks for sticking with us. And there's only three or four more questions. So if you guys are okay to uh, go through these next questions, we'll, uh, we'll skip my questions that I brought and we'll go to the ones that the, uh, are in the Q&A. And then we'll we'll try to tie it up in the next uh, five ten minutes here if we can uh, we're okay for that. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Excellent. So I got two questions, and they they tie it with our next slide naturally. They're they're around the affordability and costing piece. So the first one is um, how much is the cost of these reactors compared to solar and wind? You know, are are these SMRs? Uh, I think you just answered this one, Jason. Are are these um, safer energy sources than than wind and solar? So let's let's focus on that cost one. Yeah, like when you when you think about the cost, it's, it's a, an essential part of how we evaluate generation options at SAS Power. Uh, cost is a major part of that evaluation, of course, and keeping our rates as as low as we can and as affordable as we can is a is a driving force for our company. Uh, and so we, we're we're looking to nuclear power to keep our rates as low as we can as we transition away from fo conventional fossil fuels. So nuclear may be part of the solution that keeps our rates affordable and gets us off conventional fossil fuels in Saskatchewan. It, it may, that's where we're, that's how we're, we're looking at, at deploying it. We're not going to deploy it if it's going to take a rate hike to do so. Uh, in terms of that 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 the actual cost of it and how it compares to wind and solar, uh, you can't compare them. Uh, wind and solar, because of their intermittency, require another source of available power when they're not available. And you have to factor that into the cost of deploying them. Wind and solar are, are cheap sources of energy, but they're not reliable. And to make them not reliable, it takes extra cost, whether that be a storage option or, or what we deploy today is, is na firing natural gas. We burn natural gas when it is not windy or it is or it's nighttime or it's sun, or it's uh, cloudy out and we're burning more natural gas in the province and you have to factor that in and when you do so uh, nuclear is looking much more attractive in that front uh, when you factor in the reliability aspect of, of renewable options in Saskatchewan and we, and we have the best renewables uh, in all of Canada in Saskatchewan some of the best areas to develop those assets is Saskatchewan I, I regret to say I disagree with what you're saying there, Darcy. Okay. I I disagree that wind and solar are actually um, cheap. They're cheap to operate. They're not cheap to build. And even if you set aside the question of storage, a wind turbine is not a cheap thing, and solar panels are even more expensive. So when you do when you do the entire cost analysis, wind and solar wind up being somewhat expensive. But they're expensive in a lot of the same ways that nuclear is expensive and that you've got an awful lot of upfront cost. And that, that upfront cost is something that you have to consider when you're looking at the total cost. I'm not saying it's too expensive to do or anything, but one of the things people keep saying, I've, I've heard the phrase tossed around, you, you can't feed the world with caviar. And it's true, but it's actually wind and solar that are really expensive. What the small modular reactors are working hard to do is come up with a business plan 
that makes it cost competitive with the fossil fuels. So it won't drive up the rates. When you wind up having a huge deployment of wind power, for example, like Germany did, that's why their electricity rate doubled because it is cheaper to do this with fossil fuels in the short term. In the longer term, the, the externalities of climate change come back to haunt you, but it is not cheap to build a whole fleet of wind turbines. And it's even more expensive to try and replace everything with solar. Everything else I, you said, I agree with that. Yeah, no fair. When we, when we look at, at the cost of power, we do look at levelized cost of electricity. So like wind turbines, you, we, we get about 45% of the nameplate capacity when you factor in the availability of the wind resource in Saskatchewan and solar is much less, it's 20, 25%. And so you, you look at that over the lifetime that you're building that asset, and you come up with the cost of all that electricity you're getting, right? Uh, and in, in that sense, wind, uh, wind is, is, provides a, good, a great option. It's very cost competitive if you can manage the intermittency of it, right? The reliability and make it reliable to figure out how you fill that other 55% of the time when you're not getting any energy out of that asset. Um, and so that's where storage or, or other things have to come in to to back up that option and not increase the costs of delivering energy reliable to businesses and stakeholders and customers in Saskatchewan, right? Yeah, you have to look at everything. I'm, I'm curious where your 45% is coming from because I, I usually see those numbers. I mean, it could be Saskatchewan's like that, but I usually see those numbers top out at about 38%. Uh, yeah, that's what I say. We have great, like we have some areas where we see up to 45% uh, as a capacity factor for wind in Saskatchewan. We plan, you plan, we plan for about 40% with most of our projects and we've seen that exceeded a little bit through actual operations. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you on that then. It, they're, still not, they're still not cheap to build. <laughs> yeah, they're not cheap to build. You have to- But, but they do last, last no, about 20, 25 years, right? And so, whereas a nuclear plant, it, it is very capital intense. It takes a lot oh, of, of yeah. initial overnight capital to build the facility, but then you get reliable power like 90, 95% capacity factor over a 60 year period. So it's- and, Most of the SMRs are actually that. talking more, more like a hundred years with, with a major yeah, refurbishment. Yeah, those are options. We, when we look at the business case, we're looking at a 60 year lifetime, uh, but there may be option to invest and, and refurbish and continue operation beyond that. Well, yeah, and that, that's a conversation for another day that you and I can have over beer at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. There's there's a, another question in the in the chat here about the cost comparative, you know, kind of per gigawatt hour per megawatt hour for that wind to, to nuclear comparison. Um, I, I'm not sure if we have actual numbers, but I might take this opportunity to plug our future supply engagement. So something that SAS powers taking on right now is engaging on the development of our long-term plan. So we've just wrapped up the step one or stage one of that engagement process. And that's really setting the stage for you know, how we're gonna engage and what the principles are of that engagement are. Um, and so we'll be pulling together what we heard report over this next month or so, and then kickstarting that stage two in the, in the new year. And, and part of getting into stage two and stage three is, is going to be, we're gonna be focusing around not just the guiding principles, but we're gonna talk about what, it, what information people want, want to know about and considerations for building of that long-term supply. And so things like cost and lifestyle factors and, and capacity of the supply options uh, co come into play there. And so I think we'll be looking to build some stuff to share through that that engagement aspect and the development of our long-term supply in the, well, starting in the new year here as we start stage two and stage three. Uh, so a, a quick plug for that, that future supply uh, engagement that we're taking on. Um, you can specifically drill into that if you went to our website, which is saspower.com slash future supply. That's all about the, like I said, our engagement around the long-term plan. Um, I think I'm going to, blast through these next slides because we answered a lot of questions around these already the challenges and drawbacks and the benefits like we we, we rode the gamut even though it didn't it didn't run the way i had scripted out so i appreciate the engaged audience and the questions we got and the fact that most people are still online so 
kudos to you guys for hanging on and kudos to you know jason and Darcy for having that conversation and and making people want to stick with us uh, i i greatly appreciate uh, all of that um a couple other quick plugs here i'm gonna so we do have i said our last session uh it'll be this this format it'll be over lunch hour again uh, and so we're going to step away a little bit from the why nuclear and talk a little bit more about like how nuclear works um as we talked about it's we're a non-nuclear jurisdiction and so there's lots of questions and we got lots of questions today just about how that technology works and there's lots of folks that would um are indicating there's an interest there to, to understand that technology a little bit more as we start scoping out the, our SMR development project. Um, on the engagement tools, uh, something new that we're doing within SAS Power is, is online engagement or virtual engagement. It's something we haven't done, done a ton of, uh, but we have stood up an online engagement hub. So if you go to saspower.com slash engage, um, there's opportunities there for you to give us some feedback and ask questions. Uh, submit your ideas. Those things come to a person like me. And I said, if we need to go and find an answer, it's generally me tapping a guy like Darcy on the shoulder to, to figure out what that answer is. And then we can post it up there for, for you or, or send that information back. So it's a great way to interact with us and, and give us some feedback on you know, the development of that long-term plan. We have a few pages on there specific to the SMR development project as well. So you can ask questions specific to that project. You can open up a map of where our siting and regions are and, and you know, throw some pins on the map to help, you know, help us make informed decisions and, and move that project forward. And I think I'm going to close it here. We've, we went almost 20 minutes over again. That's, that's my time management. I apologize, but thank you all for staying with us. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thank you, Darcy.